In general, in terms of any crypto, Yakutia is just some kind of Klondike. Almost the entire republic is solid woodlands, in 99% of which a human has never set foot. The area of Yakutia is the same as the whole of India. When you go for six fucking days through endless forests to get from one settlement to another, shit inevitably goes down. Generally, the cryptos are seen in high regard, and in local folklore, retellings and stories occupy one of the most honorable places. The root Yakut faith is classical paganism, every locality and every important area of activity is endowed with spirits who are responsible for them. However, after the annexation of Yakutia to Russia in the 17th century, the local faith to some extent assimilated with Orthodox Christianity and underwent significant changes, elements of theism appeared in it. However, the spirits of nature have not gone anywhere. One of them is the so-called Silukuni. It is believed that they live underwater almost all the time in different bodies of water and do not interact with people in any way. The traditions of the Akut faith do not consider them to be evil spirits, nevertheless, you can't call the Silukun especially kind either. Their appearance is not described in detail, but they are rather presented as water devil, anthropomorphic, but possessing some fishy features. Hello Lovecraft Insmith. So, about meeting with the Silukuns. They get out from under the water only once a year, during Christmas time. As usual, they go out only at night, gather in all sorts of abandoned houses and booths far from residential settlements and there they cut cards with each other, lol. They play for their own underwater money, which looks like gold coins. Special daredevils from among people are ordered to go to some empty house on Christmas days and hide under a table or somewhere else, covered with a cloth. You just need to dress up very well, for empty houses, of course, are not heated, and in Yakutia, January frosts easily reach minus 50 degrees. If you're lucky, a party of local Silukunes will be in this house. When the Silukunes get together and the game bet increases, you should scream with all your might and turn the table over. Silukunes must be scared, again lol, and scatter. Then you can already collect the money left by them. You just need to spend all this goodness within 3 days, then the gold of the Silukunes will turn into algae, which it originally was. But you can attend the meeting of the Silukunes not only for material enrichment. During the game of cards, the Silukunes are not silent, but talk about future events and the fate of the people living nearby at length, so if you don't spoil their holiday and listen carefully, you can get hold of valuable information about your future and your relatives. In general, this is one of the types of local Christmas time fortune telling, but I can't imagine how you can be so stubborn that in minus 50 frost you can drag yourself into an empty house at night and sit there all night waiting for a crowd of supernatural creatures. And now the actual kill story which I was told as a child and from which I did not sleep well on winter nights. Heads up, it has no direct relation to the Silukans, but it was still necessary to first explain their essence, so that everyone would get the gist of the story. So, central Yakutia, January, Christmas tide, severe frosts. Two young strong brothers decide to go to listen to the Silukuns, and if they are lucky, then they can clean up their money. 
since the people's attitude to the hobby for serious Christmas fortune-telling is wary, all sorts of girlish fortune-telling by wax, mirrors and needles, of course, does not count, they did not tell anyone about their plan, not even their parents. For the outing, they chose an empty ancient booth in a meadow, which was located not far from their village. There are many such buildings in Yakutia, before people lived closer together, families were scattered over separate glades. In the evening, wrapped in the warmest clothes and taking with them a couple of bottles of vodka, the brothers left the house and headed to their destination. The mood was good, the two of them were not scared, they were accustomed to the cold. They came to the place, climbed under the dilapidated table, as expected, covered with a thick blanket. They sit, talking in whispers about everything, from time to time they sip from bottles. It is impossible to light a fire, the Silukunes will be scared and will not come, only the moonlight through the windows. Here, by the way, a detail, a stable is joined with the old Yakut booths, there is only one door between the booth and the barn, so that in cold weather you don't run back and forth, freezing your balls off. And now the brothers have been sitting for several hours, some time after midnight, both already laconic and sleepy. Suddenly the barn door creaked. The brothers strained themselves, both having one thought, now, it begins, the Sulu Kunes begin to gather. But for a while again everything is quiet, then again the barn door creaks, this time louder, it is clear from the sound that the door is slowly opening. And from the barn comes a muffled sound like a chicken clucking. Then the younger brother shouted in a voice that was not his own, threw off the coverlet, jumped out from under the table and rushed to the exit. The elder, of course, is right behind him. But he was unlucky, the younger ran out into the street, while the older one stumbled over the door frame and fell at the entrance. He began to call for help and immediately seemed to choke, then he yelled as if he was being burned alive. The younger only ran faster from this, shitting tons of bricks. As he ran to the edge of the clearing, his brother kept shouting from behind, and then fell silent. The younger looked back only at the edge of the forest, but from there it was already very difficult to see. There was a booth, quiet, there was no movement near him, and the rest could not be made out in the moonlight. It is said, he ran back to the village with a shocked expression, being in a state of confusion. He immediately told his father everything, and he almost attacked him with fists, he said. How can you be such fools, at least you should have told us about where you were going before going there. It turned out that it was in this booth that a long time ago, even before the revolution, a family lived, all of whose members died one after another for no apparent reason. The official explanation of the time was that an evil spirit devoured them. Since then, no one has lived in this clearing, although it is quite fertile. No Sulu Kunes will arrange a party in such a place, after all, they are not exactly demons, but something else could very well have become interested in two dumbasses who came to an abandoned place at the darkest of hours. The father and younger brother quickly got together, got into the UAZE and drove at full throttle back to the booth. On the way there, the father scolded his son for leaving his older brother. After arriving at the abandoned booth, everything seemed to be quiet. They stopped the car, and the younger brother's teeth began to chatter, he flat out refused to get out of the car. The father had to go to the cursed place all by himself. The elder brother was lying in the snow where he fell, face down. From the footprints in the snow, it was clear that he did not even struggle much after the fall, he seemingly died immediately. The body was already stiff to the frost. At this point the father began to sob aloud. Nothing to do, they loaded the dead man into the car, drove home. When they removed all the layers of clothing from him, it turned out that there had a hefty bruise on his back under his right shoulder blade, as if someone had hit him with a great force, right through all the layers of clothing. Later, the younger brother told what he saw before he began to run away. When the barn door creaked once again, he furtively lifted the coverlet and looked in the direction, in the moonlight at the doorway, a huge, three meters tall, black human silhouette walking in their direction. No longer being able to suppress his fear, he screamed and rushed out. Another Yakut story that scared me as a child. According to the stories, it happened in Soviet times in the Tadinsky district in a small village in broad daylight. The narrator, let's call him Semyon, was a local collective farmer and on a summer evening he was returning from haymaking to the village. The dirt road went through the wasteland, it was sunny and hot, by the way, the summer heat in Yakutia is also inhuman, rarely drops below 30 degrees, and sometimes it reaches 40, that is, the absolute temperature difference at different times of the year is close to 100 degrees. Semyon walking by himself, in a good mood, humming something under his breath, at some point notices that three people are walking towards him on the road. The one in the center is higher, 
The rest are lower. Semin perceived them as an adult and his two children. He wonder who it could be. Concluding that this must be a certain Akidin with his sons from his village, he calmly moves on. But when they came closer, he noticed that those who were walking on the sides could not be called children, as they were only a little lower than the central one. Then Semyon noticed that the outlines of the walkers were very strange, they were in the same grey clothes, and the overweight figures hidden under these clothes descended to the ground, expanding downward, that is, the abyss resembled something like a bottle. He never saw their legs and did not understand how they managed to move. Semyon was not immediately scared. At first he just kept walking with the same pace, but then he managed to make out the large black eyes on their faces, which themselves were wide as paper, twisted with horror. According to Yakut beliefs, when meeting with Abix, that is, with all sorts of evil spirits, in no case should you run away, otherwise they will chase and make ill on the spot. There was a narrow path 20 paces ahead of the road, he set out on reaching the crossing which lied before the bottle people, allowing him to avoid them. Although fearing for his life, he forced himself to go forward with mouse speed. He was afraid to look at the faces of these creatures, but as soon as he looked down, it seemed that they were about to pounce on him, and his eyes automatically returned to the abyx. As he remembered, all three were almost identical in appearance, white, without a single vein or distinctive marks, with stopped large black eyes that looked only forward, and with heavy deformed figures that became wider at the bottom. They differed only in height. Finally, Semyon reached a crossing and turned onto a path. At that time, only 10 meters remained between him and the creatures. Trying not to run, he walked along the path, out of the corner of his eye watching the abyx. To his relief, they walked by without even looking in his direction. Having moved away from them at a decent distance, Semyon already started running and ran right up to his house. He turned around a couple of times and noticed in the distance on the road the dark silhouettes of bottle people. As it turned out later, he was not the only one who saw them that day. In the village and in the vicinity, several people also noticed this trinity and were mortally frightened. Everyone agreed that these people did not have any interest in their village and were, as it were, passing through, going somewhere on their business. Something like that. This story, according to legend, took place in one of the central regions of Yakutia. In the late 70s, a certain Anon lived in a small village not far from the regional center. He was then about 10 years old and was friends with a neighbor's kid, named Vasya. One morning, Anon woke up and, as always, went to his friend's house to play, but Vasya's mother said he was ill, so he would not be able to play. Anon went to back home, and the next day found out that Vasya had died. As he was later told, the boy suddenly had a terrible pain in his head. Vasya's parents tried to self-medicate all day and only in the evening requested for a doctor at the regional center, there was only one woman doctor in the village, and even she could only deal with colds and work injuries. By that time, the child was already in critical condition, the local doctor forbade him from being transported anywhere in his current condition. Therefore, Vasya's father drove out in his Zhiguli to the city. They arrived late at night, both white as chalk. It turned out that when they were driving back through the forest, about 5 kilometers from the village, they noticed in the rearview mirror in the moonlight how a headless man was chasing them a hundred meters behind the Zhiguli. Vasya's father and the doctor both saw him. From such a distance, and even at night, of course, they could not see any specific details, both only claimed that he was abnormally tall, even without a head, his height reached two and a half meters. Vasya's father gasped, and the terrible pursuer soon fell behind. Having calmed down, the doctor gave Vasya some injections, an IV, ordered to build a stretcher and very carefully transported him to the regional center. The boy died on the way. They said that halfway to the city, before dying, he briefly came to his senses. He could not speak, but he constantly raised his right hand and pointed his finger somewhere back. Remembering the recent event, the adults peered apprehensively into the night road behind the car, but saw nothing. He died a few minutes later. But this, Anonchiki, is not legend, because it happened to me personally, I was part of a Shkalota from that very class. Perhaps so far the only really cryptic case in my life. After finishing the ninth grade, having passed the state exams, the whole class went on a hike out of town. The place where we went was chosen by the teacher, a small meadow 15 kilometers from the city, with a river and a small clean pond. We had fun, we played volleyball, ate ourselves to the full, some of the guys secretly drank the beer they brought with them. And in the evening, when it was getting dark, 
They gathered around the fire and began to tell each other spooky stories. When we got ready to sleep after that, everyone was already in such a state that they screamed nervously at every rustle. Several guys went to the edge of the forest to relieve themselves away from everyone. I started to climb into the tent when they came running back with bulging eyes and alarmed everyone. According to their stories, this is what happened. Approaching the edge, they suddenly saw that a man was hiding behind one of the trees nearby and cautiously peering out from there. In the semi-darkness, they could not clearly see his face, but they assumed that one of our guys decided to scare them after the campfire tales. They began to shout at him, telling him to come out and that they had spotted him. He again hid behind a tree and looked out from the other side. He repeated several times, before the guys noticed that each time the face rose higher and higher behind the tree trunk, soon it had peered at a height of 4 to 5 meters. And on this particular tree species, there were no lower branches or twigs to lean on. The guys, of course, got scared and ran back to us. We didn't believe the frightened classmates right away, who knows, maybe they decided to make fun of us. As a result, the whole crowd went to inspect that very tree. They did not come close to the edge, but everyone saw the white spot flickering behind the tree trunk. And the spot really rose higher, then sank almost to the ground. The girls began to cry with fear. The teachers told us to quickly get into the cars, and we drove back to the city at night. By the way, despite the abundance of spirits of everything and everything in nature, there is no such thing as goblin or its analog in Yakut beliefs. There is Bayanai, the patron spirit of hunting, and it is believed that you can encounter him in the forest. There are a lot of legends about such cases, but he does not look much like a goblin, and he is of a higher rank. The word goblin, Tayataiji, in Yakutia was called a bear. Perhaps the goblin is simply not needed in mythology due to the fact that even without him, any locality, any section of the forest, any mountain, body of water, etc. everything has its own patron spirit. These entities, I must say, have an unpleasant character, and can severely punish the traveler if he does not follow local rules. Sometimes even physically. For example, in Yakutia it is strictly forbidden, being on a new deserted area, to pronounce its name aloud, it is considered, that it mortally offends the local spirit. It's funny for you, and as a child, during a trip, parents almost kicked me in the neck for the custom of reading roadside signs with the name of the area. Even today, this is an ironclad rule, if you break it, then everyone will look askance at you. Even I myself would probably look sideways, it's one thing to sit in a cozy apartment and laugh at a stupid cattle, and quite another, if you are 300 kilometers from civilization in a dense thonic forest on a winter evening, and anything can happen. So that's it. I would look sideways. In short, there are a couple of stories about cases of violation of such rules. At the entrances to especially sacred areas near the roads in Yakutia, there are trees, completely hung with candy wrappers, coins and even larger bills. There are quite a few of them on the roads, I myself have seen five different such trees in my life. This is called Karyak, a sacred tree. If you want the unknowns not to touch you during a trip through this area, then you must pay a tribute at the entrance, leave any candy wrapper, coin or bill on the tree. Actually, in our time this rule is not too strict, even if you did not leave anything, in the absence of other fuckery, nothing will happen to you. But if you somehow insulted a tree or, even worse, collected gifts from it, then that's it, be ready for a massive attack by local unknowns. The first case belongs to the late Soviet times, somewhere, probably, the 80s. Some chief from the regional center, let's call him Nikolai, went on a visit to another area, located next door, in a service GAZ with a driver, let's call him Ivan. It was winter, they drove for a long time, and while they were on the road, it got dark. At the entrance to a clearing, they went out along a small path and saw such a decorated tree. Naturally, they knew what it was, but they didn't leave any gifts, and for some reason the driver also did a small thing under the root of this tree. They climbed back in and drove on, talking about this and that. Darkness now surrounded them, the snow-covered road was visible only to the beam of light from the headlights. Suddenly the carrier notices that the noise of the Gazix engine has changed dramatically, and the car stalled a little and began to lose speed. He clicks on the gas, the engine roars, but the Gazik can hardly creep anyway. Nikolai asks him, why did it suddenly start to smell like something was decomposing in the car? Ivan shrugs his shoulders, then looks over and sees that a skinny Yakut in shabby woolen clothes is sitting in the middle in the back seat and looks unpleasantly right at him. Ivan froze in fear, remembering what he had done by the tree, and immediately looked forward to the road again. He continued to drive the car forward on the road. The Nikolai asked him what was the matter, 
and he only nodded back, he could not utter a word more. The chief looked around and immediately shut up. The stench intensified, the car crawling like a turtle, as if the passenger in the back seat weighed at least a few tons. Both were terrified, whiter than chalk. Stopping the car in the middle of a deserted meadow though, wouldn't be a smart thing to do, so they went on. The driver glanced at the mirror inside the cab, but nothing was reflected there, the back seat. As soon as he turned around though, the same stench hit his nose, as if the passenger in the back, had died and begun decomposing weeks ago. Ivan again caught the piercing gaze of the acute man's sunken eyes. Struck and with fear he once again turned his eyes to the road, no longer attempting to turn around. They drove like this for about an hour, until they reached the first oncoming settlement. When the house lights were close, the driver felt the car go easier. Plucking up courage, he turned around, no one was in the back seat. They both breathed a sigh of relief. Although the stench did not disappear right away, having to open the windows so that the smell would disappear faster. They both lamented for a long time about the fact that it would be necessary to honor traditions in the future, so as not to fall into such horror again. Second case. By rough estimates, the story takes place somewhere in the 60s. In the Amjinsky district from Yakutsk some kind of rascal is leaving, by the way, not Yakutsk, but Russian. Nowadays he would probably be called homeless. He went to Amga to his sidekick, who promised to find him a job at a local collective farm, because he did not manage to get a job in the city, and he lost all the money in gambling. Someone drove him along the road to a point, and then he walked straight along some shallow roads. It's early summer, there are no mosquitoes yet, it's warm and light around, there is a little food and vodka in his backpack, in general, life is good. Our hero walks by himself, then sees again. Near some clearing by the road, a large branchy tree, hung with colorful decorations. Naturally, he has no idea what it is. At first the tree just amused him, then he looked closely, mother of god, there are a lot of coins under the tree and in its bark, there are even paper bills. Without thinking twice, he collected everything, he got a good amount for his position, put it in his pocket and walked on in a very good mood. In the evening, he settled down in a clearing where there was an empty summer house, put his jacket on the trestle bed, drank vodka and went to bed. Before he fell asleep, he felt that someone was pulling his leg. He tried not to pay attention to it and sleep on, but they pulled more and more. He jumps up, looks around, there is no one, a bright summer night, an empty house, an empty meadow. He lies down again. As soon as he was falling asleep again, they begin to pull, as before. This time he swore, jumped out of the house and ran around the building, no one was there. Our hero did not feel much of a drowsy fear and went to bed again, changing his position. At first he could not sleep for a long period, before finally falling asleep. This time they pulled his leg so hard that he fell off the trestle bed, and they dragged him a little along the floor. But when he opened his eyes, there was no one near him again. This went on all night, he tried to fall asleep, and someone would not let him do it. Finally, in the morning, after another pulling of the leg, he habitually opened his eyes and raised himself, and saw above him in the semi-darkness a black silhouette of a large man of powerful physique, bending over him and holding his leg. It was then that his nerves could not stand it, and so he jumped off the trestle bed, yelled, ran out of the house and ran. Realizing he left his backpack in the house, but not having enough courage to return, he continued to run. He ran all morning until he made it out to the village, knocked on the house there, and told about his misfortune. He was advised to go back and put the money back by the tree. He remembered that the money was still in his pocket, fumbling to get it, he noticed that there was a hole, everything fell out while he was running away. Of course, he did not intend to return to collect it, or his backpack. He decided to tag along with someone from the local village to Umga. It is somewhat atypical for local folklore, because evil spirits, abyss, are usually not described in legends as completely bodily beings, they are usually vague or appear in the form of silhouettes, hide in the darkness or cannot be seen, suddenly appear and disappear, etc etc, well, as in the previous stories. Nevertheless, this story is very popular to tell around the fire, and some local writers even wrote stories based on it. The case again concerns two brothers. The eldest is about 30. The youngest is five years younger. Both were career hunters and went closer to autumn to hunt for a month or two in the dense forests, where the game was not yet frightened by man. This was not their first joint long trip, so they were already prepared for it. They didn't have to worry about anything, 
The forest was their home. Settling down near some nameless river in the forest, they quickly built a temporary hut, lit a fire, and according to the local tradition fed the spirit of fire, and threw it all the local spirits, with food and alcohol so that they would patronize them, and began to hunt. There was a lot of game, in a couple of days they shot an Arley beast and were already rubbing their hands happily, imagining how much money they would get when they handed over everything. Somewhere on the fourth and fifth days, the first snow fell. In the evening, the brothers sat in the hut after the hunt, quietly dined and talked about this and that. The fire burns, it is warm and satisfying in the hut, when suddenly they hear that someone is walking behind the wall, outside. The sound of footsteps on fresh snow is clearly audible. First they grab their guns, what if a bear? But no, the steps are quite human, the sound comes to the door of the hut and a woman's voice says. BRR, how cold it is. The brothers are completely frozen. Meanwhile, the door opened, and a young woman entered the hut, quite beautiful, in good clothes, though somewhat old-fashioned, but in the forest fashion is not the law, the main thing is to keep warm. Seeing the brothers, she joyfully declares that she is the daughter of a villager not far from here, went out for a walk in the forest, but got lost, she wandered through the forests all day, already thought that she would die, but then saw a hut and a fire inside it. The brothers look at each other, they know the area well, there is no village within a radius of 300 kilometers around. But the woman is quite real, shivering all over from the cold, and they, like gentlemen, politely give her a place at the table, pour tea and soup. She eats it all with gratitude, tells about herself, etc. The older brother nods in assent, and the youngest was a hickey in life, and looks at the guest with suspicion. Seizing the moment, under the pretext of pissing, he leaves the hut. It's already dusk there, but something else can be discerned. The footprints of the woman are visible in the fresh snow. He follows them further and further, and as a result, the tracks break off at the bank of the river. And the river is still not frozen, if a woman were to cross it by swimming, she would be all wet. The younger brother's suspicions are growing, he recalls all sorts of incomprehensible ancient legends of hunters about thonic evil spirits that live in dense forests, and according to legends these spirits are so fucking powerful that, compared to them, all sorts of small abases are child's play. In general, he decides to quietly whisper about his thoughts to the bro and then act according to the circumstances. He comes back into the hut, and there the bottle has already been opened, the flirting is in full swing, it is clear that the older brother is already thinking not with his head, but with his dick. Well, that's understandable, he is not married, and the woman is very appetizing, and besides, by the looks of it, she does not mind at all. The younger one tries to break into their conversation, stating that their hunting equipment gets wet under the snow, and they ought to go out to remove it, to which he gets an expressive look from his brother, fuck you, and the woman for a moment gives him such a prickly, unfeminine, even inhuman look that the younger is shitting bricks and steps aside. He sits gloomily in his corner, meanwhile the flirting is getting closer to the bed stage. But in the end, he still managed to catch his brother when he went out into the street before going to bed. He tries to tell him about the footprints, about this terrible look of a woman and about that her legend is generally sewn with white threads, appearing as something she is not. But the older brother is not only soaring on the wings of waiting for sex, he is also very drunk and does not want to hear anything. The case ends with the elder pushing the younger to the wall of the hut and promising to give him a good thrashing if he breaks off his buzz. The younger one is in a hue, the older brother had never allowed himself to talk to him like that, even if he was thrice drunk. The couple settle down in the corner of the hut and fence themselves off with a screen. The light was extinguished, the younger brother lied in another corner, listening to the characteristic sounds. Just in case, right under the covers, he holds his shotgun with loaded cartridges in the barrel. The process continues in that corner, everything seems to be calm, and imperceptibly he was overwhelmed by sleep. I woke up at night from some kind of grinding. Judging by the fact that the coals from the fire have not yet completely extinguished, not so much time has passed. A strange grinding is clearly heard from the corner where the woman and brother were lying, and after each grinding, there is either a groan, or a soft howl of his brother. The younger one jumps out of bed and throws himself into that corner with the gun at the ready. He pulls the screen off with one hand, with the other holding the double barrel gun at the ready, and sees in the darkness that his brother is saddled by some dark silhouette of completely non-female forms, with eyes brightly burning with yellow fire, gnawing at his neck, and the sound, therefore, is heard due to the grinding of teeth on a vertebrae. The brother only moans weakly. The younger one almost fainting from such a sight, still manages to shoot at point-blank range between the eyes of this creature. There was a screech, the creature jumped off its brother and rushed to the exit. Sometimes it is added here, 
that it hissed before, we should have finished you off first. The younger brother fired another round at it, the creature lets out another screech barging outside through the closed door. He urgently stirs the coals, adding light, and bends over to his brother, but it's too late, his eyes rolled back, his throat was not open, the whole bed was covered in blood. It is also strange that later the younger brother did not find traces of blood on the floor or at the door, and outside in the snow too, although he twice hit this creature with a shotgun. As soon as dawn broke, the younger brother rushed back to the village. He returned with a team of men to pick up his brother's body and dismantle the hut. Since then, that river began to be called Abyssi Uraj, the river of evil spirits, and people ceased to hunt in the vicinity. In our village, by the way, there was a man, also a hunter, who claimed that this Abyssi Uraj was in the Alden Ellis, and that he had been there passing through a couple of times, and once even spent the night by the river, and nothing happened. Probably nonsense. This story was also told to me as a child, it is practically archetypal in Yakutia, in different variations, I heard it at least three times. They say that even before the revolution legends were spread among the people about invisible roommates of varying degrees of spookiness. This option is the most creepy. One grandfather went one autumn with his son-in-law and grandchildren to the forest to bring firewood. They had a large family, a grandfather, a grandmother, an eldest son with his wife and two children, a youngest son with his daughter-in-law, in the villages of Yakutia. By the way, many today live in large families, not scattered in different houses. The weather was good, a lot of trees were knocked down during the day. But towards evening they came across one particularly strong large large, from which the axe bounced like a stone. Even the chainsaw, the famous friendship, could not take this tree down, the chain got stuck every minute. In general, there are many trees in the forest, the son-in-law suggested leaving the tree alone and taking care of others. But the grandfather stubbornly resisted and said that he would not be him if he did not knock down this tree. They suffered all evening, but in the end managed to knock it down. That was the end of the work for that day. After a while, the day came when they began to load trees onto a tractor trailer to take them to their village. Here that same tree also showed itself in all its glory, while they were trying to load it onto the trailer, it rolled back six times, as if by itself. They brought it to their place and began to harvest firewood the next day. One of the grandchildren grabbed a tree with an axe, the back of the axe jumped back and hit him in the forehead. Seeing this, the old man got angry and ordered to take care of this particular tree first. Spent the whole day, but still managed to chop it up for firewood. The grandfather personally brought an armful of firewood from this tree into the house and stuffed it into the stove. Further, of course, the firewood did not want to fucking burn, but my grandfather was also not a bastard, he doused it with gasoline, pushed newspapers into the stove and fired them up. The firewood caught fire, and the old man wiped his forehead and began to laugh, he thought he won over that damn tree. The spooks began that evening, and not slowly and gradually over the course of months, as in American films, but immediately at full power. The family was having supper, the daughter-in-law of the youngest son suddenly screamed out loud. Everyone looked at her, and she said that someone just hit her in the face. Then again someone invisible began to slap her in the face, so much so that her head wobbled from side to side. The grandfather tried to cover her face with his hands, and then attacks started on him, hit him in the stomach, then began to whip in the face. When the grandfather, leaving behind him the spook Kremlin, ran out of the house, the invisible man again took up his daughter-in-law. He tortured her all evening, then, when both her cheeks turned red, like crayfish, he kind of fucked off. But it was too early to rejoice, at night it climbed into her bed, threw off the blanket on the floor and began to crush her with all its non-existing weight, and strangle her. At this point everyone was alarmed, the girl was in tears, the men did not understand anything. The grandfather clutched his head, realizing that some kind of fuckery was going on with that tree. They invited the local priest, the one with the cross, censer and holy water. He barely entered, when the entity immediately spilled all the water on him, broke the vessel, tore the cross from his neck and threw it somewhere into a corner and began to whip the priest himself on the cheeks. As the father came, the priest ran away. Then a fun life began. In the mornings and during the day, the hex usually calmed down, but he made itself felt with small dirty tricks, he put cow shit in milk, ruining the dough, or knocking cups off the shelves. In the evenings, every time he brought his daughter-in-law, he beat her, grabbed her clothes, put all kinds of nasty things in her portion of food, felt at night, although he didn't seem to try to rape, and thanks for that. Everyone else, including the grandfather, were not particularly targeted if they did not try to protect the girl. 
If they did try, then he wrestled them, and much harder than with a girl, he could easily induce bruises and break bones. The people involved themselves have never been able to grab or even feel anything. The grandfather then turned to the local shaman. He refused to come to their house, arguing that the evil spirits are clearly stronger than him. Since everyone agreed that Hex had come to their house with a tree in which, apparently, it had previously lived, the shaman advised to take the wood from that tree back to the same place. And so they did, and the firewood went back without any tricks. It did not help though, as the roommate, apparently, seemed more interested in staying in the village. So they lived for a whole month like this, trying all the means, from coal circles on the floor to prayers and cats, but nothing worked, and after every attempt to poke him out, the entity played pranks with increased zeal. In the end, from such a life, the daughter-in-law had a clouding of mind, she began to go mad before their eyes and ramble about everyone. By the way, during this period a security officer came to them specially from another village, who, having heard rumors, decided that the locals were deliberately spreading the infection of obscurantism. He came in with an exclamation, well, where is your monster? and right there the pistol that was hanging on his belt discharged itself, he almost shot the dick off the checkist. He grabbed the belt, and immediately from behind the stove someone, aiming and very aptly, began to throw horse poop at him. In a panic, the security officer pulled out a pistol, looked behind the stove, and there was no one there. Then the entity began to beat him in the face as he had done with others. The checkist ran out of the house and never returned. As a result, they decided to send the daughter-in-law to her relatives in another village. While driving through the village, she kept looking back and crying, saying, My poor Abbasi cannot keep up with us, he falls behind, beckons me to come back. Then, on the outskirts of the village, My poor Abbasi was left crying by the birch. And suddenly all delirium disappeared, and her mind returned to normal. Naturally, after this, she did not return to that village, and the marriage broke up by itself. However, the village did not mind, as soon as she left, the hex seemed to evaporate, all his antics and games stopped. At first they shied away from every shadow, waiting for his return, but this never happened. Apparently, without the girl, the Abbasa got bored, and he returned back to his fucking happy ending, as they say. Today I will tell you a little about a phenomenon called Karatai, bypass, an analogue of very ordeals in Christianity. It is believed that after a person's death for some time, his spirit does not leave the earth, but sequentially visits all the places in which he visited during his lifetime, for 90% of the villagers, all these places, in principle, are limited to their native village and adjacent areas. The difference between circumambulation and this ordeal is that it does not happen inaudibly or invisibly. When the spirit makes such a circumvention, some people can hear strange sounds and voices, as if sweeping under the sky, and especially sensitive individuals can see this process. Moreover, the very word karatai in the Akut language contains an element of coercion in its meaning, the spirit does not make a detour of its own free will, but it is as if forced. So, my grandmother's own sister in her youth also saw everything. By the age of 40, her vision deteriorated, she underwent a couple of operations, and as a result, she began to see very badly. She herself explained this by the fact that she was too keen-sighted, and others did not want her to delve too deeply into their affairs. She used to tell me pretty spooky stories as a child. Here's a story that touches on that same detour. So, in our village some old man died, he was buried, after that a couple of days passed. My grandmother's sister, along with the others, went to the field for haymaking, the deceased during his lifetime, naturally, also spent a lot of time at haymaking, so it was quite logical for him to visit this place when he walked around. And then after lunch, in the midst of work, she suddenly heard strange sounds, like a dog's howl mixed with crying. She stopped, looked around and saw that in the distance along the road some object was floating in the air like a goat, someone was sitting on it, and on either side of it two dark silhouettes resembling human ones were floating in the air, and it seemed they beat him, more precisely, they beat him with some kind of sticks. The beaten, in turn, emits that same plaintive and human howl. Grandma's sister got spooked and looked at the others, but no one but her noticed it. By that time she was already accustomed to the fact that sometimes she sees what is inaccessible to others, so she began to silently observe. This whole strange procession sailed past along the road, since my grandmother's sister was in a field far from the road, she was never able to see these creatures up close, and she was not eager. It's just that at some point she somehow understood, either by her voice, or by her appearance, that the central person is a goat. The one who is being beaten, is the very deceased who was recently buried. 
This left her with a very painful impression, in the Yakut tradition it is not considered that bypassing is accompanied by such a harsh BDSM, and the deceased was quite a decent person during his lifetime, so it was hard to imagine he'd be treated this way after death. She, telling me this, was sure that she witnessed the detour process. Before and after that, after the funeral in the village, she sometimes in the evenings vaguely heard indistinct voices and sounds, as if coming from the sky, but saw nothing. The Yakut Zombies Yes, yes, in the Yakut beliefs, even they found a place, and there are even two types of zombies in Yakutia, Uir and Irednik. In local yellow newspapers from time to time, especially during Christmas time, there are articles like Uir, Yakut Zombie seen around village, so the first species is much better known, although the description of the classic American zombie is more suitable for a Irednik. So, Uir is essentially not a living corpse, but the restless spirit of a dead man. It is believed that at some stage after the death of a person they ask, well, how, will you go further, or do you want to hang out in the middle world? 99% agree to leave, but some individuals who are particularly eager not to leave this world respond negatively. Then they rip off all the skin from their face, do not ask how it is possible to rip off the skin from the spirit, I don't know, turn their heads 180 degrees and send them back to Mother Earth. By the way, in the case of suicides, such a thing is done without asking. The Yakut religion generally has an extremely negative attitude towards suicides. There, this disfigured spirit huddles on all sorts of abandons not far from the place of his death. He is afraid of the light, he is constantly cold and generally shitty, and very soon he begins to regret his choice and get angry. Soon the degree of his anger reaches such a point that he is ready to pounce on any unfortunate traveler who has come to the dwelling. But he still does not look too much like a zombie from the films, rather it is a completely ordinary abyssy, however, the UIR is credited with the ability to sometimes purely physically kill a person, which does not often happen with ordinary evil spirits. Remember the story about Christmas Tide and the booth? It is quite possible that it was the UIR who snuffed out the life from the elder brother there. The circumstances, at least, are suitable. UIR is not eternal. After a rather long time, at least several decades, or even centuries, it seems to dissipate, loses its strength and still leaves the planet. What happens to the lost soul in the future is not entirely clear, mythology in this matter gives vague answers. Diretnik is completely different. It is really, just a revived corpse, possessed by evil spirits. An evil shaman who bequeathed his body to all demons for use, some suicides and ordinary people devoured by especially powerful abases, can become a Diretnik after death. Diretniks are very similar to American zombies, they have nothing to do with their lifetime personality, decompose on the move often cannot speak clearly, move convulsively and twitchily, inhumanly strong and fast, and sensitive to injury and are eager to kill and eat. If a person becomes a diretnik, then this usually happens within a day after death, if you do not have time to bury him according to special rules. If this is not done, then, as they say, hold on, bitches. There is a popular story about two hunters regarding this phenomena. So, two hunter friends were in the deep taiga in an unfamiliar area and got a little lost. Meanwhile evening came. It was summer, so at night it was not very dark, and they decided not to go to bed, but to try to get out on the road. By midnight they wandered into some particularly quiet thicket. One of the hunters was one of those who are especially sensitive to all sorts of bullshit, and he said that it was best if they got out of the place as soon as possible, something wasn't quite right. But before they had time to turn around, a hairy creature, similar to a man, jumped out from behind a tree and attacked the hunters. Before they came to their senses, he knocked one hunter, the psychic, to the ground and bit hard on his shoulder. Meanwhile, the second hunter came to his senses and bashed the creature on the head with a stick, then, when he jumped back, fired almost point-blank from a shotgun. The hunter rushed to the wounded friend, but he shouted to him. He then explained that he felt that he was dying anyway, and that after his death he would surely become a derednik. The friend tried to protest. I'll take you out on the road somehow, catch a car go to the hospital, but he said. At the same time, he began to turn pale before his eyes, his eyes protruded from the sockets, the veins were swollen, in all, a shitty situation. He told his friend that after his death, he were to immediately cut off his head and bury the body without at a sufficient depth without any coffin and cross. His stomach down, legs spread and his severed head face down between the legs, stuffing the earth into his mouth. 
then to run away as quickly as possible. Are you crazy? Are you fucking with me or something? The friend assured him that it is an ancient custom of burial for a person who is set to become a deretnik. If you bury it like that, then the oppressor will not be able to rise. As they talked, he got worse, bloody foam came out of his mouth, and he died. And now the second hunter is standing over the body of a friend in the semi-darkness of the forest and thinking what to do. And yet he did not comply with the burial request, as doing this to his own friend was a far-off thought, he simply dug a grave, put the body there face down, buried it, hung all sorts of fabrics on a tree so that later somehow it could be found, and went to look for a way. Hurried, fearing that the same creature will jump out of the forest at any moment, exploding the disadvantage of him being alone. An hour passes, two, three, and dawn is near. And suddenly he hears, somewhere behind his back, far in the forest, branches crackling under someone's feet. Well, he immediately became alert, took the gun off his shoulder, and quickened his pace. But the sound is quickly directed towards him, as if the thing knows exactly where he is. The hunter got the spooks, turned around and prepared to meet this thing with dignity, whoever it was. The sounds were getting closer, and finally a deceased friend jumps out of the bushes, all in the ground, his hair is disheveled, already covered with cadaveric spots, the eyes did not move, the clothes hang in rags, and some tubes hung from the mouth and ears, either some veins, or snot, or some other garbage. As the deretnik saw him, he immediately rushed forward, like a wolf, growling, twitching, clicking his teeth. The hunter shot him, missed. Meanwhile he got to him and threw him a good 5 meters with one movement of his hand. The hunter, fortunately, did not drop his gun and fired again, this time blowing the entire head off the dead man. But even this did not stop the deretnik, the almost headless corpse continued to run after him, waving his arms, somehow unmistakably determining his location. He, calmed down, only after several hits with buckshot in the chest and limbs. When the deretnik fell, the hunter quickly dug a new grave cut off what was left of the head, and this time buried it exactly like that, as the friend asked him before. When he finished, he fucked off right away. This time no one began to catch up with him. Soon he went out onto the road. By the way, they usually add to this story that this friend appeared to him later in a dream and, on the one hand, thanked that he did everything in the end as it should, and on the other, he reproached him that he was right from the very beginning. They say, because of this incident, the hunter developed a bunch of serious problems, It seems that in the previous thread I mentioned the patron spirit of the hunt, which is called Bayane. From the pantheon of Yakut natural spirits, this is one of the most revered, almost on a par with the patron saint of horse breeding, whose name is Jayzeji. Horses among the Yakuts are very sacred animals, almost like cows in India, and only a couple of points lower than the spirit of fire, Hayton Tamiri, this one in general revered almost on a par with the highest deities. Bayane, lives in the forests, which of there is no shortage in Yakutia. It is believed that he has a register of all the hunters in the Akut territories, and he can, at his discretion, benefit or, conversely, deprive anyone who has went out into the forests with an intention to hunt. That is, if you behave according to local rules, don't offend any local spirits, are not a greedy fuck, and, of course, are savvy in the hunting business, you can count on Bayan's patronage, and the game itself will fall into your hands. Personally, the spirit does not like to appear in front of pitiful little people, and if someone sees Bayane, then this is considered to be great luck. You ask, where are the spooks? Well, there were some cases. For example, a legend. A group of hunters went into a very fucking dense forest to shoot game. A hunting party consisting mainly of grey-haired old men and professional hunters. They settled down by some nameless river, set up camp, and began to hunt. Only now they somehow did not come across game at all. It seems like there are a lot of beasts in the forests, here and there they flicker, and the men are not noobs in their business, but nonetheless, no luck. And on the third day, the youngest green guy from the group, who recently turned 18 years old, had a dream, as if, while they were all sleeping in their temporary barracks, a luxurious woman like this emerged from the river and, as she is, wet, in tight clothes went straight to his bed and began to smile at him. The guy also smiles at her, everything is okay, but then the woman glanced displeasedly at the old man snoring around and went into the forest. The next night, the same girl appeared again in a dream. This time she began to hug and kiss him, but when the guy wanted to advance on her, she continued to deny his advances, stating that It's not the time. In the following nights she continues visiting the hunter in the night, 
Meanwhile the hunting failure continued, the group was already melancholic as a result. They began to talk, stating that it is not worth going back and changing the area. The guy personally didn't give a fuck, he was noob in these matters, what the elders said, was to be done. Only now the woman from his wet dreams kept his mind occupied. On the next night the woman still split, complained that having a bunch of old bastards around spoils everything. She smiled conspiratorially at the guy and whispered. In three days your old people will fuck off from here, well, you, dear man, stay, then everything will turn out right for us. The guy woke up and fell into despondency. He walked with his gun through the forest, as if in a trance, suffering from the internal strife. What to do? On the one hand, it's only a dream. On the other hand, the woman appears in his dreams every night for a reason, and she is so warm and lamp-like that the guy thinks that without her his life will not work out well. But, again, the dick knows who she is, all of a sudden some phonic creature pretends to be cute and lures him into a trap to eat, see one of the stories in the previous thread. In general, the guy is feeling angst and butthurt. The third day has come, and the old people, by a general council, came to the conclusion that they were not happy here this time, it was time to go home. They began to gather. Only our hero is not going, he sits by himself, staring at one point, not saying anything. They told him, dude, are you crazy, you decided to stay alone in a dense forest? He is silent. They began to ask what was the matter. Silence continues. The only thing on his mind is the woman, but at the same time he is somewhat afraid. The old people attempted questioning him for a long time, but achieved nothing. They decided that the guy was clearly not sane in his thoughts, and everyone pounced on him, tied him hand and foot. The guy didn't protest. So they took him home, tied up. And at home, the father had a chat with his son. Your grandfather, he said, was a great hunter, and I myself had excellent inclinations, but I was only born in the city, so I took a different path. Bayan I himself noticed you, it was his trick to make a real Yakut hunter, he wanted you to stay in the forest. If you would have stayed, it would have been good for you. The game would have pursued him on its own, he could have just stretched out his hand and take it. But the offspring did not have enough courage to choose his own path and meet the spirit of the hunt face to face. So you will remain a sucker for all your life, concluded the father. And so it happened. The guy lived for a long time and, in principle, normally, but only did not have happiness in life, he felt that he was born for another life, but when he went into the forest, he could not shoot the lousy hare. All the beasts within five kilometers from him seemed to detect him immediately. That's how Bayane took offense at him. In general, talking about shamans, is a separate very interesting topic. In pre-revolutionary times, there were quite a few shamans in Yakutia, almost every village had its own shaman, then, with the coming of the communists to power and the associated forcing of atheism and the sawing out of non-proletarian elements, the number of shamans greatly decreased. But still, to this day there are revered elders, to whom people from all over the republic come to ask for advice or to be treated if medicine is powerless. Yakut shamans have three castes according to the level of power, small, medium and great, it depends only on the genetic factor and innate ability, they were very few great shamans, and each of them could directly reach the highest deity of the Yakut religion. Your young Artoyan. Also shamans are subdivided into predatory, black, shamans and non-predatory, white. In general, there is not much difference between them, it's just that a predatory shaman does not hesitate to use his skills against pathetic people that piss them off. But usually shamans do not seek to kill ordinary people, except perhaps especially fierce enemies. Great shamans, all their lives, waged wars among themselves sending curses and corruptions on each other, and therefore did not relax for a moment. By the way, it is interesting, but women shamans, or Yudaganshi, there are only one or two of them in the whole history, were considered to be superior to male shamans. As a rule, if a woman becomes a shaman, then great or at least average. The greatest of such being Yudaganshi Alice Ardeg, who, in her rather young age, overpowered almost half of the other great shamans of her time. The initiation of shamans is said to have taken place in early childhood, usually coinciding with the onset of puberty, or earlier. For example, the initiation of the ninth, Togustak, the great shaman from the Ustalden region, happened like this. The boy was nine years old, and he was left at home alone during the day, his parents had gone somewhere. He was sitting in the booth and playing on the floor, when in the courtyard he suddenly heard the stamping of a whole army of horses. The boy, of course scared, hid under the bed. The horses stopped, 
Then someone's heavy steps were heard going from the hitching post towards the booth, and not to the front door, but directly towards the wall, near which the boy was lying under the bed. At the wall, the footsteps died away, and someone's voice spoke loudly right above the boy. And after that, the boy immediately lost consciousness. Ancestors, returning home, found the child lying in delirium and fever on the floor. As usual, they sent for a doctor and a shaman. The shaman, having examined the boy, forbade them from touching him. Let him roll around, just do not forget to feed him. The boy's soul left the body and is far in between the worlds at the initiation ceremony of the shaman. About this inner world. Most often it is said that the messenger spirit delivers the soul of the chosen one to one of the sacred places of Yakutia, and there begins a fierce ritual called dismemberment, just from the name alone it is clear that there is nothing pleasant for the terribly in this. I will try to retell, as I remember, the memories of an average shaman that I read as a child. There was a thunderstorm that day, and I ran into the meadow to find a cow and a calf and drive them into the barn. Driving the cattle back across the meadow, I saw in flashes of lightning how a huge tree appeared in the middle of the meadow, on the top of which a stranger bird staring at me unceasingly. Her heavy gaze made me feel bad, and I seemed to have fallen somewhere. Side note, the boy was found only the next morning at the edge of the forest naked, climbing some tree and trembling all over. After that he was brought home, he lay unconscious for three months, only opened his mouth while feeding. Therefore, the subjective events described below took place precisely during this three-month unconsciousness. I woke up on the top of a huge mountain overhanging a wide river with a very turbulent stream. For some time I lay looking at the endless sky above me, unable to move. Then a giant man with a bear's head with a lance and a large axe approached me waddlingly. First, he drove his pike to the ground next to me, and then he chopped off my head with his axe. It didn't hurt. Then he planted my head on the lance so that I could see what he was doing with my drooping body. He methodically dismembered my body into small pieces of flesh for several hours, and then, when he finished, three creatures, resembling large birds with human faces, landed on the mountain from the heaven. They began to sort the pieces of my flesh into several heaps, arguing about something among themselves. In the meantime, they scolded the bearhead for the fact that during the dismemberment he managed to lose somewhere one finger from my body. They then flew away, and I saw a cloud of metallic color flying from the north in the sky. A horde of demonic creatures dived from the cloud onto the mountain which immediately began to devour my flesh from the left heap, clearly enjoying the process. Strangely, after devouring, they immediately vomited the flesh back or did not even swallow, but only suckled it. Then they flew away, and a copper cloud flew in from the west, other humanoid creatures descended from there, approached the central heap, and everything repeated. Then a grey cloud flew in from the south. Finally, when everyone was gone, the bird-like ones appeared again and began to fold my body again from pieces, fastening them together with their own abundant saliva. From my lance, I watched in amazement how meat, muscles and bones healed. This process lasted quite a long time. In the end, the bear had pulled my head off the lance and placed it on my neck, and one of the bird-like ones skillfully licked my neck in a circle, and my head fused with the body. I felt unable to stay on my feet, and finally I heard them solemnly proclaim over me, now you are free. Rise, created by the highest command, the average shaman anointed by the north. Following this, I immediately lost consciousness again and woke up in my bed. I was told that it has been three months since I got sick. Side note, judging by the description, this is an unnamed sacred mountain at the mouth of the Lena River, the place where, according to recollections, the initiation rite of many Yakut shamans took place. Interestingly, the exact location of this mountain is unknown, if it is a real geographic place at all. The experiences of this shaman must be understood in such a way that his astral body was split into separate particles and tied with the patron spirits of the north, west, and south. And since the initiation itself took place at the sacred place of the north, he became a shaman, anointed by the north. It is believed that the spirit that was present at the initiation of the shaman and feasted on his body will henceforth be positively disposed towards him and will listen to his requests. For the same reason, the initiation of the great shaman lasts longer, the body is dismembered into smaller pieces, and there are more guests who want to devour it. There are many legends about the aforementioned Udagancha Alisard, mainly about how she got rid of the shamans at war with her, and some lulls she got into breaking off any skeptics who publicly announced that they did not believe in her power. I will tell you one characteristic story from each category. By the way, 
according to the description of her contemporaries, she looked like the most ordinary girl, she did not stand out either in height or any demonic features of her appearance. On the contrary, in physique and facial features, she seemed very fragile and helpless. Many mention that in normal times, not during a trance, she was often mistaken for an ordinary young and attractive girl. The first story is about how Alice Arde killed a shaman from a neighboring area, whose name was Olaze. The conflict between the shamans proceeded sluggishly until Alice Ardeg, because of something, once took offense at Alessia and promised to throw him out of this world by the end of summer. Olaze, having heard this, took a defensive position and all summer very rarely got out of his booth and constantly performed some of his rituals to protect himself. But still, sometimes he allowed himself to relax and somehow on a hot July day went with his relatives to the neighboring Alas, Glade, to Mohe and swim. After lunch, splashing in the lake during another smoke break, Olaze noticed a strange, lonely cloud of rust-colored color on the western edge of the sky. Right there, a black raven flew over the Alas, cawing in panic. The shaman's face changed. Having told everyone present that the raven was his patron beast and he told him that Alice Ardake set out on a journey according to his soul, he urgently left the clearing and went to his booth. As he reached his house, the cloud, expanding and turning black, almost overtook him. People who got in the way of the cloud told that it was pouring rain and very strong whirlwind circled, and the area covered by the cloud was constantly changing. Olaze locked himself in his booth, shut all the windows with the enchanted valves he had prepared in advance, and he himself, dressed in his shamanic clothes and taking a tambourine, went down to the cellar under the booth. The cloud overtook his dwellings, and a huge black whirlwind descended from it, which was seen by people from the distant edge of the clearing, something like a tornado. The whirlwind circled for some time around the booth, blowing to shreds all the things in the yard, including the hitching post, as if not knowing how to approach the booth. But then the whirlwind jumped onto the booth itself and entered the building through the chimney, which the ill-fated Olays forgot to cover. Terrible loud noises and shouts were heard from the booth all evening, the cloud from time to time threw thunder and lightning. Towards the evening, it started going again and headed back to the west, gradually dissipating. For several days people were afraid to approach Alessia's booth. Finally, they realized that he would not come out and plucked up the courage to enter. The booth was a terrible mess, all things were literally blown to shreds. The shaman lay huddled in the corner of the cellar, clutching his tambourine to his chest. His face was a bloody mess. And Alice Ardek, who during these events danced in a trance in her house, coming to her senses, expressed regret that during the campaign she accidentally killed two small shamans from the same area, who turned up under attack. Indeed, these shamans on the same evening both became very ill and died within two or three days. The second story is more humorous than creepy, but it shows that she was no stranger to catching lulls. Once, into the village where the Udaganja lived, there were some officials passing through the city, I remind you that it was still Cyrus time, two people. Hearing that a shaman lives here, they did not really believe, but nevertheless they came to visit her to take a look. Seeing a young girl instead of a formidable old woman, they felt more at ease and began to behave rather cheekily, they ate, drank, began to discuss it among themselves aloud, and in the end, in an ultimatum, demanded that Alice Ardek show them Hocus Pocus. She modestly agreed and began to portray a trance. The men looked at her for five minutes, ten, half an hour, they got tired of it, and they swore, got up and walked away. But as soon as the door of the booth was open, a column of water poured into the house outside, as if the booth was underwater. The men were instantly soaked through, floundering in the icy water in which the fish were swimming. And Alice Ardek only laughed at them. They felt that they would soon drown that way, and tearfully asked her to end the performance. She graciously agreed and told the men to catch one fish from the water. With difficulty, but they succeeded. Meanwhile, the water kept coming. Well, now, if you want to stop this, said the Udagancha. Squeeze these caught fish with both hands with all your might. The men began to squeeze, and she shouted, Stronger! Stronger! The veins in the temple swelled up from the tension of the men, and Alice Ardeg, looking at them, rolled with laughter. And suddenly, the dudes came to their senses, and it turned out that they were standing in the showroom in front of a whole crowd of local spectators with their pants down and, puffing, squeezing each other's dicks. The people naturally all filled with laughter. The men blushed violently and rushed out of the booth and never returned to the Alicerts. Yakut shamans at all times admitted with amazing unanimity that they sucked together in front of the Tungus shamans living in the northern regions of Yakutia. Even the great shamans were afraid to meddle in there, 
they say, even a not very strong Tungus shaman will pose a challenge for a great shaman from the south. There is a legend about one of the great Yakut shamans, forgot his name, who, for no reason at all, plunged into a lethargic sleep one night and so spent three years. Then he woke up, as if nothing had happened, and said that that night three years ago, he decided to see the light, and he took in his mother's beast, an eagle, and went to wander across the open spaces. He flew in this way somewhere to the north, and then he saw, a huge sized owl flying towards him. It caught him like a mouse, carried him to the nest, and there, leaning its whole body on him, held him for three years, and, as usual, shit and pissed right on him. And only three years later, the eagle managed to seize the moment when the owl was distracted, and the spirit of the Yakut shaman was finally able to fuck off in a way. As he later said, the owl was one of the mother's beasts of a certain Tungus shaman, that is, if the Yakut shamans have one beast, then the Tungus shamans could have at least a hundred. So it goes. Here's another story about the meeting of the Yakut and Tungus shaman. Once one average Yakut shaman drove into the northern regions. It was winter, he rode through the forests and valleys on a cart, which was harnessed to evil. He carried with him, among other things, large pieces of beef and sacks, with which he was paid in another village for the fact that he cured some sick person. And somewhere in the middle of the road he came to a snow-covered alas meadow, where a small dilapidated booth stood. It is immediately evident that a poor man lives here. And our hero, who imagined himself to be a wizard of the highest category, burst into the booth, and there, an old man and an old woman. Well, he explained everything to them, being a kind of shaman, who is going around on his business, so, nice people, treat him nicely. The old man and the old woman hustled, made him a meager, but quite bearable dinner, and the shaman, satisfied, fell asleep. The next morning he got up, had breakfast and drove on, without even a word exchanged with the owners. He drove all day and in the evening the road brought him to the same alas, from where he left in the morning. The same booth, the same old man with an old woman. The shaman got pretty spooked, tried to channel to find out what the hell was going on, but did not understand anything. He went into the booth, said that the cart had broken down, and therefore he spent the whole day on repairs and decided to spend the night with the owners again. The old man and the old woman reacted calmly. Again a meager supper, this and that. The shaman tossed about in bed for a long time in anxious thoughts, but still managed to fall asleep. In the morning he left again. It was a snowy day, the road was almost entirely covered with snow, but the bull stubbornly crawled forward. In the evening, a light from the booth chimney flashed in front of the alas. Naturally, the same one. At this point, the shaman felt that it was something unclean, he fell into the trap of a stronger sorcerer. But who? He still didn't sense the presence of another shaman nearby. He had to enter the same booth for the night for the third time. This time he didn't even try to make excuses, he just walked in and said nothing. The old man and the old woman only exchanged glances, then the old woman, as it were, hinted that there was nothing to eat for dinner, the shaman had eaten everything in the previous days. Like, maybe today the dear guest himself will find a treat for them? That is why our hero, thinking about his pieces of beef on the cart, just grunted, he did not intend to share his food with simple dicks. Then the old man got up, saying, Well, it is not appropriate to leave our guest hungry, then you will have to cook our meat. The shaman in confusion watched as the old woman brought the old man a sharp axe, and the old man sat down on the floor, bared his right leg, then took the axe and, chopped his thigh. Busily continued to chop off that leg. They separated the leg, then the old man got up on one leg and began to split the leg into pieces. Then he gave this meat to the old woman and told her to cook soup. She took the meat and went to the side of the oven to cook. Well, then the visiting shaman guest who had trolled him all these three days. Falling on his knees in front of the one-legged old man, he prayed that he would forgive him, he said he did not know who they were, and to not kill him, as well as admitting his stupidity. The old man, wrapping a cloth around his stump, sat down in his chair and was silent. The shaman was killing himself more and more, begging for forgiveness. He promised him all the good that he was carrying with him, and a bull and a cart to boot. Meanwhile the soup was ready, and the old woman called everyone to supper. The old man motioned for the shaman to sit down at the table. He had to sit with them and eat this terrible soup. However, the soup was quite tasty for itself, without any disgusting aftertaste. So they went to bed. The shaman, of course, did not sleep all night, but did not try to run away or attack the owners, he knew that nothing would come of it. In the morning the old man finally opened his mouth, by the way. His leg grew back in the morning and looked intact. 
he allowed the guest to get out of his house, leaving all his belongings in the bowl. The shaman silently jumped out of the booth with tremendous relief. Before going down the road, he looked at his cart and saw that one of the bags of meat was open, and a decent piece of good beef disappeared from there, just enough to make a good soup. All day he walked on his own two feet in the snow and eventually got to some alas, where a large family lived. They told him that a shaman of Tungus blood lived with his wife on the way to them. One rural family did not have livestock, either the cows could not get pregnant, or they gave birth to dead calves. If a normal calf was born, it would be puny and die at most a week after birth. In such cases, local folklore pushes two possible reasons. Either a, either the family is simply not lucky, the spirits of cattle do not patronize them, maybe because of some past or present events or indecents. Or b, either a calf eater, Torbuya cabecita, a petty evil spirit, who feeds on the spirits of cattle larvae, has settled in their stable, so they cannot survive. Of course, the problem exists, but not on such a scale that you should cover your head with ashes especially since the events of the story took place not in the ancient remote past, but somewhere in the 60s to 70s of the 20th century. The woman returned home in the afternoon, and they had a child of about 5 years old, who sat at home during the day while the parents worked, and found her child in the barn playing with some pieces of wood. And even before entering the barn, she clearly heard that the child was talking to someone inside, two voices stood out clearly. She interrogated her son and found out that for some time now he had a friend, a shaggy, nondescript boy, dressed all in clothes of skins. A new friend, who always lived only inside the barn, came out of a dark corner from somewhere. They often played together, and the shaggy boy was not a mistake and was catching a profit from this acquaintance, persuading the child to secretly carry him food from his table. And he insisted that the boy should not tell anyone about him, especially his parents. Otherwise I won't play with you anymore. The woman at this point was shitting bricks and told her husband everything in the evening, a family council diagnosed him as a calf eater. But what can you do about it? The head of the family consulted with knowledgeable people in the village and one morning gave his son a sharp steely acute knife. Hide this in your trousers, he said. Pretend that everything is fine. When this new friend comes up to you again, fuck him up and stab him in the stomach with all your might. A harsh acute kid, without any emo suffering, agreed to kill his friend. In the morning, the child went back to the stable with a large portion of all kinds of delicious food. He sat down in the middle of the stable and started to play by himself. This time the friend didn't appear for a long time, and when he finally looked out of his corner, he was clearly wary. I sense a disturbance in the force, something's wrong. He said suspiciously, to which the little guy replied, Don't be a jerk, everything's fine, come here, I've got some nice food, let's play. After a while. The boy in the skins came up to him and started to eat the flatbread. That's when the kid took a moment to look away, pulled a knife out from under his pant leg, and fucked him right in the stomach with a sharp blade. The barn was filled with a high-pitched squeal and the child passed out. When he came to himself, he saw that he was lying alone in the barn, an unfinished cake was lying nearby, and the knife was still in his hand, and the blade was stained with very dark and thick, almost black blood. More so, the friend in skins did not appear again and the cattle finally began to give birth normally. They say that ghosts are abundant in our city of Yakutsk. Periodically at the table they tell scary stories about abbacy, evil spirits, that don't let people live in peace. I didn't believe in ghosts. Categorically. And I only laughed at such stories. They didn't make any impression on me. But one day my impenetrable materialism could not stand the test of time. I urgently needed to find an apartment to rent. And luckily one small apartment came up. You know, perhaps, those houses, like an anthill, nine floors, studded with apartments. Lilliputian square footage for one person, and a lot of people, I was still a student at the time, so this did not bother me. In addition, this small apartment was almost in the city center, with a view of the church, such a pastoral landscape, and cheap, like in a fairy tale. I rented it from a young family who for some reason chose not to live there, instead opting to live with their parents, which in itself is strange. That's where I became a bit wary. In addition, I knew that the neighborhood was built on an old cemetery, of which only the church survived. But, carefree and happy, I moved into the apartment. All I had was a cot, a table, and a couple of chairs. I made myself comfortable, drew a funny watercolor rabbit on the bathroom door, hung curtains, etc. in general, tried to create a comfy place. 
One strange thing came to light, the windows of the apartment faced south, that is, in summer it should be just a scorcher. But in fact even on the hottest days, it was cold as in a tomb. The first night I awoke up from a terrible snoring under the cot. I thought that I heard the neighbors next door, but only in the morning I realized that there were no neighbors behind the wall, but there was a street, because the apartment is at street corner. And the nearest neighbors are across the room. That is, their sniffing could not be heard. I was surprised, but that's all. A few days later I was even more surprised, I heard in the night the sound of a light stomping of bare feet, as if a child was running. I woke up. Water was rustling in the bathroom, and a child's wet footprints were appearing on the floor. They appeared in a chain and immediately disappeared. To say that I was shocked is an understatement. I couldn't think of any other explanation than that it was a dream. So I turned away and fell asleep. When by the end of the summer the nights had become dark, in the evening I felt a natural creepiness. For some inexplicable reason, I was getting scared to the point of shivering. I started sleeping with the light on. Soon the light broke. I called an electrician, and they fixed the wiring. The next day it was broken again. I called the electricians again. Soon I had them coming in five times a week. I'm not exaggerating. I was angry, I said, what kind of craftsman are you, you can't fix it once and for all. The wiring breaks somewhere else every time, they made excuses. And then a friend of mine stayed with me for a week. After the first night she said, I should sprinkle some holy water on the apartment. And all night long the taps were open and closing by themselves and the child was running around the apartment. It's scary, how do you live here alone? And there was a light bulb hanging from the ceiling. Naked, with no chandeliers or lampshades. So, as soon as my friend spoke out, it fell down. The cord on which it was hanging broke in the middle, as if someone had pulled it as hard as he could and torn it. The electricians, when they came to fix it, laughed that my friend and I must have been swinging on that cord like monkeys. We immediately went to church, got holy water and sprinkled the entire apartment, every wall, every corner, whilst reciting our father. And you know what? It was easier to breathe. For three days. For three days there was silence, the light did not break, the water was not opened, no one was sniffing and stomping at night. And then everything began with renewed vigor. And the rest of the holy water in a clean wash jar was covered with mold. When my friend left, it became impossible to be in the apartment at night. Especially in the kitchen. For no apparent reason to go in there in the dark was just creepy. In general, it ended this way, one night I forgot my bag in the kitchen. By nightfall, I hadn't gone back to get it. And in the morning I found a child's handprint on it without one finger. The print could not be washed off with any detergent. I didn't spend the night there again. I quickly rented a new room, moved my things, and gave the keys to the owners. They, by the way, didn't even ask the reason why I had fled from their apartment in such a hurry.